Hello, hello, hello. It's Stephanie here and welcome to episode 130, would you believe it, of the Rent to Rent Success podcast. And this is a bumper episode that I know that you're going to love. It's something that I get asked about so often. How can you run your rent to rent business, be making money every month, but not be working another job? How can it become super part time for you? And we're going to be talking about how to use virtual assistants to really rocket your business. And I have with me today a special guest, Rizwan Ahmed. And Rizman is going to talk to us about systemizing your tenant onboarding with virtual assistants. He's going to talk to us about running your HMOs in a compliant way with your virtual assistants. And he's going to talk to us about how he manages 60 rentable units across the UK while working a full-time demanding corporate job. And how he used to own his own virtual assistant agency is going to be talking to us about how to make that relationship really work, because that's another thing that many of us worry about. So welcome to the show, Rizwan Ahmed. Thank you very much, Steph. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So we were talking a little bit before. You're an experienced property investor, Rizwan, and also you do have a bit of a sideline with Rent to Rent. So I'd love it if you could just uh, describe how you first got into property and what your property business looks like today. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I um, I did start, I'm London based, so I started my property investing back in 2012, um, slowly just building up single letter properties. Now, being London based, I generally like my properties to be within arm's length or, or within the M25. Um, and I, I built up single lets. And if you live in the southeast of England, you'll realize that... Um, uh, the yields are somewhat not that great. Um, so then I started to transition into HMOs from around 2015. Um, and then I, the number of tenants obviously uh, magnifies quite quickly because rather than having one tenant per household, you've now got up to six tenants. Um, so around 2017, it pretty much stalled uh, because I was still maintaining my full-time job and trying to manage these tenants. Um, I have a bit of a, a, a trust issue using letting agents and there weren't many letting agents at the time that would take on HMO. So I was finding that I was managing that as well. Um, so at 2017, I, I did sort of um, manage to scale up to about 17 properties at the time, which I was quite pleased about, but I couldn't take on any more. I was just really hit a, a glass ceiling and couldn't progress any further. And then I sort of decided to onboard my first VA at that point. Now, the reason I did that was because I, I there was just a lot of admin tasks involved. And a lot of the things I was doing was very much uh, computer based. And typically, if there's a lot of things you're doing on a PC, uh, you can pretty much outsource that. Now, that's not necessarily just property related. Uh, my VAs do a whole range of tasks for me, ranging from uh, booking holidays or uh, booking medical appointments, um, and, uh, helping me to post social media uh, posts. Uh, booking um, activities or uh, booking maintenance for my car. So it's, it's a full spectrum of things that can be, you can use a VA for. Um, but what had happened is that from 2017 to where we are today, I pretty much doubled uh, my property portfolio only because I no longer had to focus on the administration mm -hmm. of my properties um, or look after my tenants. Um, that's now down to my VAs. Uh, they manage all of that. Uh, I have a team. At one point, I had a team of eight people, um, not just doing properties, but various other things for other clients as well. And I'll touch on that very um, uh, uh, topic uh, regarding clients that I used to work with. Um, but what had happened is that essentially by outsourcing that activity of onboarding and looking after tenants, um, I grew my property portfolio. It allowed me to expand my interest into other areas. So I don't only just do property and have a full-time job. I've also done activities uh, involving e-commerce. So that, uh, you know, Amazon FBA, for example. And again, I use VAs to manage that as well. So the beauty of all of it is, is that it is difficult to make things 100% passive. Uh, I'd like to think that I've managed to make uh, my rent to rent as well as my other property letting about 80% passive. Uh, but it's difficult to make it uh, 100%. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I just want to ask a question there that just came to my mind is, are you, you're managing 60 plus units at the moment and it's 80% passive. How much time would you say that it takes you to, how much time do you personally spend on managing each 
week or each um, month? Realistically, I, I still do spend about uh, an hour to an hour and a half a day in the mornings. Uh, so before mm-hmm. I go into the office. Um, so because my VAs are based in the Philippines. Um, so for me, uh, I am a bit of an early riser. So I tend to have my morning sessions with them at uh, about six in the morning. Uh, and we're generally just going through um, any open actions that we have. So one of the key things that you need when you decide to onboard a VA, uh, or even if you're just managing yourself, you've got to have some sort of uh, um, product to um, to manage your activities. So things like um, Asana, Trello, Monday, um, these are quite popular tools and they're free. And uh, you can use that to essentially list all of the actions that you have that need addressing. And as you list those actions, you then start looking at, or at which actions can you outsource uh, to a VA. So in answer to your question, typically it's anywhere between five to maximum 10 hours a week, uh, depending if I actually have to do some viewings. Unfortunately, virtual VAs can't do physical viewings of property. So there is an element of, uh, uh, of my time that I have to spend uh, for that, perspe- for that pr- purpose. Yeah. And then that could be another step as well that you could have someone because we started off like yourself with a VA and then we employed somebody in person so we no longer have to do the viewings which I was very excited about Um, but um, let's talk about you've got a couple of rent rents and I thought that was a very interesting story because you were just buying properties and renting them out and building your own portfolio over time, over many, many years. And how did you get into rent to rent with one? Um, yeah, I'll be honest, Stephanie, rent to rent isn't my primary strategy. I normally do like to buy and acquire and hold because one of the key benefits of doing that is the you, you gain from the capital appreciation. Um, but I like the idea of rent to rent. So I also have dabbled into a service accommodation um, as well. Um, but the, the concept of rent to rent that you don't need that uh, high level of capital where you're paying stamp duties and high legal fees and obviously the deposit. So that was a great strategy. And I could see that it attracted a lot of uh, youngsters um, into that who wanted to get their foot on that property ladder. Um, so, so again, in answer to your question, how did I get into it is that um, uh, there were uh, I've been approached a couple of times by young guys. Uh, you know, these are people um, who are maybe 18, as young as 18 who would approach me and say, look, uh, Rizwan, uh, I found this opportunity. I'm working with the agent. I've built a fantastic rapport. But when it comes to the credit rating, um, unfortunately, I'm not passing. So I need to sort of JV with someone who, A, um, has a bit of experience, maybe a bit of financial stability um, that can help me pass that credit rating and also, where necessary, become a personal guarantor. Um, A lot of agents or landlords, if you're renting from them, do require that, um, uh, some sort of personal guarantee. So I was prepared to be that sort of partner with them on the basis that um, I would like to be as hands off as possible and that whoever I JV with, that they would be doing the sort of the physical running around and meeting the tenants and addressing any of the issues. So it was a bit of a problem solving type uh, position that I took for people um, who offered me their uh, uh, these opportunities. So they were finding these were all uh, rent to rents, presenting it to me. I will do a bit of uh, calculations, make, make sure it met my criteria. And if it did, great, I'll, I'll take it on board and I'm happy to JV with them. So that was uh, one case. Uh, another case could be that uh, people who do come on board come to realize that managing it's uh, managing a HMO or a rent to rent has its challenges and it's not quite their cup of tea. They might be tied into a two or a three year term and uh, they're sort of looking for a get out of jail card. Um, so I've stepped in in that ca- occasion as well, where I've sort of um, uh, taken over people's rent to rent as well. So a bit of a rent to rent uh, solver is uh, how I've inherited my first two. And, and that's all through networking um, as well. Um, so making yourself known about what you do and and what you're specialised in and having a system in place certainly helps in that respect. So it's a bit like the A-team. You just come in, swoop in and solve the problem and save the day, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the A-team, uh, I'm only one part. I'll, I'll say if it was the A-team, I'm definitely faced because I've got the good looks. And uh, <laughs> the other, the other, my, my other team members are, uh, yeah, they're based in the Philippines. They will do all the due diligence for me. Uh, they check the... Uh, uh, you know, they'll check the status of the property, the contractual. They're not lawyers, but they've got a good understanding. I've, I've had my VA team for about, well, since 2018. 
Um, so uh, from that perspective, over the years, they've built a very good understanding of the, the UK property markets and understanding the nature of tenants and all the compliance around it, because compliance is becoming quite a headache now for a lot of landlords. And, uh, and the more compliance there is, the more administration tasks there is uh, involved. So I think VA is becoming absolutely mandatory. I, I said earlier on, the key thing for me was that, do I value myself more than five, six pounds an hour, uh, which is what a typical and quite a good wage is for someone out in the Philippines. Uh, just to put it in perspective, someone who might work in a, a McDonald's or, or equivalent in the Philippines, they typically earn about eight to 10 pounds a day. So if you're now offering them six pounds an hour, um, for them, it's, it's, a good, it's a good salary. I get asked that a lot. Is it is it slavery? Is it exploitation? But um, no, you, if you speak to the VAs, uh, they're generally quite happy. Hence why I've had them st sticking around with me for uh, for four plus years. That's so good to know. And I'm glad that you clarified there about the, the pay and that that is a high pay for the type of work in the Philippines. Or it is a, a good, solid um, amount to pay. And it makes it really affordable for people um, based in this country, who are running their rent-to-rent -rent businesses. Um, but like we did before we took on our first VA, I think so many people are scared of doing it. They think, I don't have a system. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. This VA is going to be so much time and energy that it's all going to go wrong, and I'm going to end up doing it myself. So Rizwal, tell us, what's the secrets to success with making it work with a VA? And specifically, I'm talking about rent-to-rent -rent here. Uh, yeah, the, the key thing is to first, list of all, what are the sort of activities that you do on a computer? Uh, so the first most challenging thing is finding that rent to rent. What is that criteria? What is the area that you're looking in? Uh, what is the cash flow that you're looking for? How many rooms are you looking at? So you've got to, first of all, define what you're expecting your VA to do. When you onboard a VA, remember, the VA is not a coach. They're not a mentor. They're not a specialist. They're a virtual assistant. The key is in the word assistant. They're there to assist you with what you want. So you are always in the driving seat and you have to tell them what you want to, to have done. Uh, I mean, there are VAs, of course, that are specialists. They may be very good at social media or web designing or bookkeeping, etc. Um, so in those cases, that's fine. You can leave that to them. But things like research um, and, and focusing maybe more on the rent to rent side is that it's, it's, it's a business. A rent to rent is a business and there's many aspects to it from onboarding a tenant to maintaining them while they're on, uh, you know, a tenant of yours to the uh, managing and maintenance, the bookkeeping around it. So all of these aspects are key things that you have to consider, which you're doing uh, probably without realizing, and you're spending and killing a lot of your hours doing this admin work when someone else could be doing that. Now, people are always put off about trust. Oh, gosh, this VA is based thousands of miles away They're in a different time zone. Um, they uh, don't have access to my accounts. Of course, it takes time to build trust. And, um, you, you know, when you're in business, there's an element of uh, a risk appetite that everyone has to have. If you've got no risk appetite, then you shouldn't really be in business because it's those that are prepared to take a risk, uh, that are prepared to, you know, uh, take that action uh, that will move forward. And it's those that don't that pretty much stay very stagnant um, in their life. So, yeah, you, there is an element of risk in business, um, but you you have the opportunity to work with a VA. And the good thing about VAs is that it's not like hiring a full time person in the UK. There's a lot of law and governance and a whole load of compliance stuff around just employing someone. It's very easy to hire and fire a VA. If you don't like that person, you can pretty much fire them within a few hours. Um, and, and that's fairly, I know it sounds really, really harsh, but that's, that's the reality. Um, when you have, when you interview a VA, or you'd normally typically do it over a Zoom or a Skype call, you get to, it's important that you have a good sort of feeling about what this person is doing, what their lifestyle is, because you, a lot of VAs are typically, um, well, they're usually sort of young mums, uh, what I've found. Um, that, that's the typical sort of criteria. They're, they're usually professionals that were in the corporate world. They speak very good English. But um, in the Philippines, the culture is, is that once someone becomes a mum, uh, they generally stay at home. Um, so what they're looking to do is uh, look for alternative sources of income. And the VA is uh, a quite a good 
um, alternative for them from the corporate life. So the VAs I've had have worked in, uh, you know, in the corporate worlds like ING Bank or, or, or Deutsche Bank, HSBC. A lot of them have been in the banking industry. So they're very qualified, graduated level people. Um, English is almost like their first language there. So there's no language barriers. But a lot of people don't like the VAs because of trust. So the key thing is getting over that trust value. Uh, and once you've got that, um, then, you know, the world's your oyster. I mean, I've got to a point where my VAs, um, I know this will sound scary to a lot of people, but they have access to my bank accounts. Uh, I have multiple bank accounts because I JV with many people. So they send me a screenshot uh, or a summary every morning that uh, this is your account. This is your cash flow over the last 24 hours. Yeah. Yes. But I suppose as well, that even sounded scary to me, but um, it's step by step. So when you first start working with a VA, obviously you're not on day one going to say, right, log into my bank and do this and that. You're going to take it step by step, build that trust, build that time. And over time, um, they will prove themselves and you'll feel more open. But you will still put controls in place that you feel uh, satisfied with. That's right. Yeah. The key thing to do is, like I said, is document what you're spending your day to day tasks on. And then once you've done that, uh, the, the way to start off is to um, document it or, or do a screen recording using free. Again, a lot of these tools um, uh, like Loom and Skype mm -hmm. and um, Asana, whatever uh, project management tools you use, they're all free. So it's not expensive to get that environment set up to work efficiently uh, with a VA. Um, but once you've uh, understood your tasks, record what you're doing because you have to provide those procedures and processes to a VA. Um, under, they need to know what that final uh, output looks like. So if you're doing due diligence on a rent to rent, um, when should they reject it? Um, so if the cash flow, for example, if you're looking to make a cash flow, let's say of 500 pounds a month, if that doesn't criteria is not met, you don't want to be bothered by it. Let, let that be rejected. So documentation is quite key. Um, to um, before you onboard your VA so that you know exactly what it is you're expecting them to do. And for every task that you expect them to hand over to them, uh, be clear how long you expect them to spend. Cap it off at maybe 10 minutes. If you expect them to do a research on a property, it should only be 10 minutes. Then say to them, if you're spending more than 10 minutes and either I've not explained it properly to you what you need to be doing or you're completely misunderstood what's required. So initially, in the early stages, when you onboard a VA, it, you do need to do a lot of handholding. And that handholding can be anything from four to six months. So there will be that initial bit of on, onboarding. Um, when I started with my very first VA, we were doing maybe about two or three hours a day. And then slowly that built up to a whole day, eight hours. Then it built up to two VAs, two full-time VAs. So you will find, you'll slowly find that um, uh, uh, your workload starts to increase as well. I think that's such great advice. Um, I When we first took on our VA, it was for three hours. In fact, the very first one was just pay as you go. So right. she was charging us only for the hours she works. Now, I think for all the VAs, I like to just start at three and make it my responsibility to fill that time so that they know what they're getting. And But at the beginning, you can just do pay as you go. And I would be interested to hear from you, Riz, what you think some of the best ways are for people to uh, start. And then I'll come in with a few of the ideas um, where we started for for from with with the virtual assistant sure yeah just touching on that topic about pay as you go and, and i think that is the best way to to go forward it's quite difficult for someone to say right i'll have you for 40 hours a week and i, I and i'll pay you i don't know 500 a week um a lot of people don't want to make that sort of a commitment and a lot of vas are open to the idea of uh, being paid per hour um so that means that they literally only get paid for what they do there are people, when I initially started, I was using screen recording software um, just to confirm that they are doing what they're doing and they're not claiming false hours, etc. cetera. Um, I don't use that anymore. I've, I'd like to uh, trust my VAs. And, and I think they don't like the idea of constantly having Big Brother recording or watching what they're doing um, as well. So yeah, that's on, on the pay-as-you-go model. Um, and that gives flexibility as well to someone who just wants to try it out. Um, how uh, what a VA is like, how to engage with them. 
Um, what was your question, sorry, Steph? Were you asking about how to find it? Say you've got a, a rent to rent business and say you have got properties. Right. Um, what, what's a great place to start in task wise for a VA? Uh, all right. If you've already got properties and you're asking what sort of task they can start off doing for you. Um, right. So if your VAs come with a lot of different backgrounds. So if you think that your requirement is very specific, um, then you can. Uh, there are platforms like what we have in UK is like JobServe, for example, as a popular platform for finding jobs, for finding uh, uh, VAs. Um, you can in the Philippines, there's a very popular platform called onlinejobs.ph. Um, so onlinejobs.ph, you can type in there uh, um, uh, UK properties, or even if you type words like right move in Zoopla, what that does is that it searches the criteria of people um, who are, and there's thousands and thousands of VAs on there that may have used uh, so, um, software or, or the platforms like Zoopla and right move. And then they, you can see their CV and you can understand, well, what kind of skill sets do these people have? Have they done research? Have they managed tenants? Um, are they happy to make phone calls? Um, have they done tenant onboarding? Um, so my VAs pretty much can do all of that. Um, they can even make calls uh, to like um, organizations like NRLA um, if they want to get a bit more technical or, or, or legal, some form of legal advice, for example. So... It's down to what you really want the VA to do. So everyone is different on how they run their rent to rent. But typically, we are all doing a very similar thing, whether it's rent to rent or you own your own uh, property. Mm -hmm. um, it's finding the tenants. So finding someone that can post on spare rooms, for example, uh, maybe before even posting, doing a bit of research on what the current market values are for rental rooms in that area. So they can give you a rough idea, right? Okay, Steph, uh, you've got this property. The room has become available. Someone has moved out. Based on the current markets, uh, we can now charge X amount uh, for that particular room. So they can post that for you. They can respond to the queries that come in uh, because that's fair. And, and that's the general platform, I guess, when it comes to onboarding uh, or looking for tenants. Um, and that whole process kicks in uh, from that point. We're a very online company, uh, and in order to make a business as passive as possible, I am a bit picky about my tenants. If tenants are not able to complete an online form or upload required documents, such as bank statements or the, their right to rent uh, validation, then I don't really move forward with them because I, I find tenants like that um, are not going to be aligned with the way that I run my business, uh, which is I know sounds a little bit sad because there are people in their 60s or sometimes in their retirement and sometimes they do struggle with that. Uh, and unfortunately, they may get rejected. I'm not saying always, there are very smart people in their 60s and plus. Um, but we we need people who are quite tech savvy, i.e. they know how to use their app, they know how to download uh, bank statements or um, credit rate uh, reports, etc, and forward that on to us. So that what the point I'm making is that a VA can participate in that whole life cycle from onboarding to the to the day that they um, uh, to the day that they leave and going around in a cycle to advertising that room again yeah no absolutely there are some core um core tasks and so that was one of the ones that I could not wait to get off my plate so I onboarded the first two HMOs nine tenants one was a five bed one was a four bed and said all right I'm never doing that again um, and we, what did we do? Yes, Nikki and I created a flowchart of everything, actually went on Spare Room, copied and pasted the, the templates of what I was emailing to people under different circumstances so that the VA had that as well. So she's got a template to work to. Obviously, she's going to have to tailor it to different uh, people. Um, but then she was able to go through, that was before the days of Asana, you know, and at the time it was on um it was on Nexcel, each column, each each tenant applying had a row, but now you would put it on Asana yeah. and they go through that process. And then the other great thing about it is that with the um tenant management software like Coho, you can you you set yourself up on there, which means that your VA then once we we only start Coho, um, or we only start the tenant management software once the person becomes a tenant. We don't use it for the viewings, etc. Um, but once a person becomes a tenant, 
then they go on to the tenant management software and that can be managed from anywhere in the world by anyone who you who you give the details to but the thing I love about it is you can oversee it so everything can be seen and the other thing that I love about the VAs is within Gmail within G Suite the way you set up your emails means that you know we can go into any of the inboxes if we need to check something verify something I mean we're not in the VA email uh, mailboxes on the regular but say if there was an emergency or there was something we needed to find out we still have access so I really love that we still have access to all that um, information of the work that they're doing yeah correct yeah it's it's important as a, a company owner that you still have that high level visibility so we do I do have to have touch point like I said I have a morning session with my team they know that I don't really like to be disturbed during the hours of sort of eight to five o'clock. Uh, although they generally sign off about three o'clock. Bear in mind, they are about eight, uh, seven to eight hours ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So um, I just generally look at the updates that come up on, on Asana. Mm -hmm. um, now, you mentioned uh, Coho. Uh, I know this uh, this uh, isn't typically around, uh, this uh, session isn't around different tools. I mean, I looked at Coho a couple of years ago. It, it, it looks like a great tool um, at the time. Uh, two years ago, when I first looked at it, it didn't have that level of maturity that I wanted, uh, although it has a really snazzy and sexy interface. Uh, I went for something which was around a lot longer and a bit more boring, to be fair, is the Arthur system. Um, and the key, and I think uh, if you want to be as passive as possible, you must have the right tools and systems in place. Yes. Um, so yes, uh, having the physical, you know, having a VA is fine, but a VA without a tool, it's like a builder without a hammer and a chisel yeah. and the usual stuff. You've got to equip them with the right software. And the good news is, is that most of this software is, is free. Uh, but yes, there are things that you do need to pay for. I don't know much about Coho now, but I use Arthur and I do pay quite a bit of money to Arthur. But it, it works very well. It's quite a mature one, probably one of the most mature uh, property application tools uh, or property management tools out there. But it integrates with my Zero for my bookkeeping. It integrates with uh, credit reference agencies. Um, mm -hmm. It um, integrates with, uh, you know, you plug in your, and I use NRLA as a, a standard for all of my templates for tenancy agreements or Section 21 or Section 8 notices. So everything is quite well integrated into that one platform. So between the two, Asana and um, um, and um, Arthur, those are the two key platforms uh, that we use. Um, so when you do have a VA, just bear in mind that you do need tools and applications. Um, you, you've got to pay your VA, so you've got to consider things like uh, making bank transfers. So we use uh, quite a popular product called Wise. For that, it used to be known as TransferWise. Um, you, you've got to have a common drive where you share, and I think you talked on Google Suite, which is probably uh, one of the better ones that I found because I used to use uh, um, Open Drive or Dropbox, which which are also good and and beneficial in some cases. But uh, for me, the Google Suite uh, worked the best. Um, so yeah, I guess you've got to make sure you've got the right um, uh, tool set now. I'm, I'm happy to any of your uh, listeners who are interested in, in having a flow chart, I'm happy to uh, provide a, a flow chart of our onboarding process uh, as well. Um, so they're happy to get in touch with me. Uh, I do also have a website uh, regarding uh, outsourcing related activities, which uh, maybe you can drop the link for that later on um, uh, with regards. That's called outsourcingme.uk. To be honest, um, uh, uh, Stephanie, I have started to wind down the outsourcing business. So we, we're down to a, a handful of clients now. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to completely systemize it uh, as much as I would like to, uh, but it grew very well during lockdown. Uh, a lot of people were working from home and uh, they, they decided they wanted an outsourcing uh, they wanted a VA, so we were offering VAs uh, um, uh, to them, not just for properties. So actually, most of my clients were in the healthcare and, and teaching um, environment. Um, so uh, we we accommodated for various uh, disciplines, not just uh, property related. So uh, again, I know this is a property discussion that we're having. A VA is pretty much capable of doing anything, um, which again you 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 do on the on your computer. 
Yeah, I love it. A VA is is capable of doing pretty much anything you can do on your computer. And we do so much, you spend so much time. I've just found it so liberating in the property business. As I say, I hardly spend any time in terms of day to day management on our property business, because we've got a full time member of staff who's doing the day to day interface and going out to the properties and so on and corresponding with people. And also, uh, um, we've got two VAs working in different parts of the business, not just the rent to rent, um, not just the HMO Heaven, our actual property management business. But yes, as you say, if we, if you're list, if you're, if you're watching this on the website, on the video, I do have Rizwan's website up. It's outsourcingme.uk, and you can go there and contact Rizwan and get the flowchart. I really highly recommend that, the onboarding flowchart. And if you're in the Kickstarter program, of course, you've got the step-by-step um, onboarding process within there as well. So Rizwan, let's just end up by talking about the secrets to success. What are the few things that people need to know or do to make outsourcing a success? Um, well, the key thing is, is uh, understanding that the most valuable commodity that you have is your time and, and value your time. And I think I've said this once or twice uh, earlier, is that do you value yourself more than five, six pounds an hour? And most of us should be. Uh, and if you do, then, and you do a lot of admin work, g- give it to somebody else. Um, don't think you're a superhero and you can do everything. You can't. You will burn yourself out. You you are missing out on opportunities. And by outsourcing those, you will free yourself a lot of time to do the things that you really enjoy doing. Uh, whether it's just watching Netflix or whether it, you, know, you want to venture into a different uh, business venture. Um, first of all, free up that time. We all have, uh, I mean, a lot of people get uh, quite... Uh, amazed at, uh, sorry, I'm sort of blowing my own trumpet here, that I have a full-time job, I have a young family, I've got an Amazon business, I've got a life property portfolio. I used to run this uh, outsourcing business as well. Um, so, you know, And I'm also quite actively involved in other charity events and things. So that's all only possible because I outsource the admin side of things. And, uh, and that's the key thing you've got to understand is valuing that time aspect of, of what you do on your day-to-day uh, uh, life. Uh, once you've done that and you've uh, you've understood what it is that you can outsource, you give that to a VA to do, and then you can start building uh, and work on your business, right? Not in your business, work on your business. There's a very important distinction between the two. And, yes. Oh, sorry. And, yeah, and, and, and essentially once you've done that, um, then you'll, you'll see um, – the amount that you can achieve compared to others is is quite remarkable. Like I said, I got stuck uh, when I had um, uh, reached uh, about sixteen or seventeen properties. I, I just didn't have that time of the day. I was go- I was literally just doing four or five hours sleep. Uh, it was quite tough. Uh, but then I got introduced uh, to the idea of VAs and using virtual assistants to outsource and systemize. And um, yeah, from that point, it's allowed me to balloon, and I and I continue to look to uh, to grow uh, my property portfolio. Absolutely. So, Rizwan, like yourself, I found outsourcing to be incredible. So, if you would like to have your own VA, whether you've got a property business, another kind of business, or whether you want somebody to help you manage your personal life and do all the things we have to do all the time, insurance and whatever else we we do uh, running our family homes, um, then Rizwan can help you in getting started with VAs. Go to outsourcingme.uk, and you can also find Rizwan on Facebook at Rizwan Ahmed. Now, Rizwan apparently is quite funny on Facebook. So <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's not it's not a very serious side of me. But if you want to just get an idea of what I'm like, then by all means, uh, uh, if, if you're brave enough, have a look at my uh, Facebook. Uh, but I do need to portray a bit more of a, a professional image on there. So apologies to anyone uh, in advance. But uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to help. I get a big buzz out of helping people, adding value to people's lives. Um, uh, if, if you are considering a VA, um, I do have a, a 20 page document, um, just detailing the sort of things that you could use a VA for, how to onboard them, where to look, what are the challenges that you may face. Um, if you're looking to make that journey yourself, uh, or finding a VA, there's a lot of things you need to be aware of now, Philippines or wherever you decide to have your VA, uh, a lot of the, 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 a lot of them are in the third world country. So you've got to be aware about, uh, um, um, interrupting 
disruption to their electricity, maybe the number of children that they have. Um, the, all of these aspects um, impact the VA's ability to maybe deliver work for you. Um, so uh, we've been doing this for the last four or five years now. Um, so helping clients and helping them to find that right VA for them. So we can help recruit a, a VA for you as well, uh, should you wish to do that as well. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for, well for that generous offer. I know how game changing it can be to have a VA, not only have a VA, have the right VA for you and also have the right skills and information to be able to onboard that VA and make, you know, help to make the relationship be really effective for both parties. So thank you so much, Rizwan, for joining us. Thank you for watching and for listening. Remember, we also have our free gift. If you're not on Audible yet and you like audio, if you've enjoyed this podcast, we have the number one best-selling Rent to Rent Success audio book, and it's free on Audible if you're not an Audible member yet. If you are, you'll need to use your Audible credits. It's at renttorentsuccess.com slash audible a-u-d-i-b-l-e and if you want to know more about um what Rizwan was talking about how to onboard your VAs and all of the other goodness that you can download free at his site then go to outsourcingme.uk so thank you again Rizwan um is there anything you want to add as we as we depart no, no, that's great. Thank you for having me on uh, on your studio. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can help some of your, uh, your, your mentees and your listeners. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, until next week, have a great rest of the week. And remember, believe bigger, be bolder, be a game changer. See you next week. Bye for now. Bye-bye.